So uh, are you viewing the correct mode? We see, we see the slides, yeah. Oh, okay. Um, so thanks, Peter, for the introduction. Uh, so uh, I'm Zuchun Liu, a PhD student in Hong Kong UST, and also a visiting scholar in CMU. And today I will talk about the binary neural networks. And I will start from some backgrounds of BNNs, and uh, uh, then I will talk about my several recent papers uh, in how to improve the binary neural networks. Mm. So okay, uh, let's get started. To so to begin with, uh, why why we would like to study binary neural networks? Because nowadays deep learning is almost everywhere in our life. Uh, for example, in many uh, like. Uh, for example, we can see many self-driving cars are car carrying cameras on top of it. Uh, they are using the deep learning for perception and control, and many drones are equipped with the deep neural networks for depth estimation. And also the VR headsets are using the advanced 3D model to process the augmented reality and re virtual reality images. Like uh, these mobile devices in the real world scenarios are limited in the computational power and storage. So when we want to deploy our deep learning models to mobile devices, model compression is needed to reduce the model size and computation. And, uh, to, and this, this it can help us to meet hardware constraints of the mobile devices. Hmm. And among various compression techniques, binary neural networks offers a promising solution. And it binarizes both weights and activations to only minus one and ones. And the definition of the binary neural network is that most of the weights and activations in a neural network are both binary. So we will dive into more details and variations of the binarization functions here. And so the advantage of binary neural networks are very significant. It can bring up to 32 times the theoretical savings in storage because the previous weights stored as 32 bit floating points are binarized to only one bit 2%. And it can also bring about around 64 times theoretical computational reduction because the computationally heavy real valid matrix multiplication are now replaced with the bitwise XNOR operation and the bit counting operation. Mm. Thus, in, thus, in today's talk, I will discuss about the network binarization. And uh, the outline for today's presentation is as follows. Uh, I will start with some backgrounds of binary neural networks, uh, in introducing its history and the characteristics of BNNs in the forward and backward path. Mm. Then I will introduce two of our work focusing on the designing the BNNs, uh, BNN architectures and uh, improving the training techniques, uh, which are the barrier net and the React net. And uh, then I will propose to, then, then we propose to use the neural, net, neural architecture search algorithm to discover the suitable neural networks considering the network binarization. And uh, specifically, we propose a group-wise architecture search space for solving the representational ca uh, capability limitation in the binarized network. Mm. And if time limited, I will introduce two, uh, two more works of our understanding papers. One is the latent weights do not exist, a, a collaboration work with the Plumera AI. And another is our newest work published on CPR 2021, discussing how to adapt BNN chaining under the self-supervised scenario. And the, at, the, and the, at the end of this presentation, I will explain several uh, the codes of several prevalent binary, binary network building blocks, including how to change the binary activation and how to up, update the binary weights, etc. Mm. And, uh, and, uh, and here I will start with part one. Uh, so introduce, I will introduce two of our work on BNN structure design and op optimization techniques improvement. Mm. And uh, here is our first work by RealNet, targeting at improving the performance of the BNNs. And this is our work collaborated with Bao Yuanwu, Wen Han Luo, Xin Yang, Wei Liu, and Kuang Ting Chen. Uh, the conference version is accepted by ECCB 2018, and its journal, ver its, its journal extension is published on IJCB. Um, 
So uh, as we mentioned before, BN has the advantage of high compression ratio on, the, on both the memory and the computation. And, but it has a disadvantage of, of the severe accuracy drop compared to the real value networks. So for example, at the time BioNet is published, the XNonet only achieves like 51% uh, top one accuracy, while the real value ResNet 18 achieves 69% top one accuracy. So uh, in this work, we investigate the reason for the accuracy degradation. And we find that the accuracy drop comes from the comes from both back forward pass and the backward pass in BN optimization. Mm, so in the forward pass, BNN are lacking in the representational capability. And in the backward pass, it is difficult to train BNNs with the discrete set functions. Mm. So in the forward pass, uh, so I will start with the forward pass first. Uh, so in the forward pass, the real value weights and activations are binarized to minus one and ones with the sign function. And those real value activations are computed from the networks and the exist in both training and inference stage of the BNs. Uh, and the real value weights are used to update the BN, used to update the binary weights in the training process. And we will start with explaining how real value activations are generated in a binary convolution network and how the activations are binarized. Mm, here, as see we, uh, here, as we can see from the figure, our source activations and weights in the one bit convolutional layer are both minus one and ones. So the output of the one bit convolution are actually real valued integers. Mm, because the uh, convolution is a multiplication and summation process. So multiplication of the binary weights here uh, is, can be done with the XNOR operation. And the outputs of the XNOR operations are binary. But these binary outputs will be summed up uh, using the bit count operation to become the integer outputs of the binary convolution layers. And this results in the real value activations will exist after every uh, binary convolution layer. So uh, thus when we concatenate more than one binary convolution layers directly, uh, the real value outputs of the current binary convolution layer will got binarized again in the next binary count and to become the binary activations. So, so in this way, Mm, a lot of useful information is lost, and uh, this repetitive binarization process will result in a huge information loss and, and result, in, uh, result in the accuracy drop in the binary neural, net, binary neural networks. Mm. Thus, in this work, we propose to use a parameter-free shortcut to propagate the real value feature maps inside the BNNs. Uh, so these shortcuts are connected to the outputs of each convolutional block. And in this way, the real value information can be greatly preserved. And because the real value feature maps already exist in every output of the binary convolution layer, we don't need to use extra computation to calculate those real value outputs. We only need to use an adding operation to add the feature maps, and uh, this incurs the negligible computational overhead. Hmm. Oh, okay, then after handling the information loss in the forward pass in BNS, we find another cause of the inferior performance um, lies in the backward pass. So in using the sign function in binarizing the activations, because the sign function is non-differentiable, we need to approximate its derivative in order to compute the gradients. Uh, and this approximating process will result in the gradient mismatch. Mm. And uh, we, here we illustrate the gradient mismatch effect and propose our solution to alleviate it. As shown in figure A, the sign function is an infinite, uh, has an infinite gradient at the origin, but has zero gradient everywhere else. So we cannot directly optimize a network with the sign function. So as we can see in the figure B, the previous works used to uh, use the derivative of the cliff function to, ap uh, to approximate the derivative of the sign function. But the shape of the clip function is different with the sign function. 
and this results in the gradient mismatch as shown in this shadowed area. Uh, uh, so, uh, so in this work, we propose the second order approximation to the derivative of the function as shown in this figure C. This can reduce the mismatch area and enhance the accuracy. Mm. And the proposed approximation to the derivative of that function is expressed as this formula uh, corresponding to this, this uh, shape of this shape. And so in the forward path, we still use this set function to obtain binary activations. And then in the backward path, we use this tighter approximation to generate more accurate gradient and this can boost the accuracy. Mm. And then another, uh, the third issue is that uh, in, in the barrel path lies in the binary weight up update, um, because the magnitude of the gradients is around 10 to the power of minus four, while also weights are binarized to minus one and one, and the, the weights are discrete. Uh, so, so the gradients are not large enough to change the size of binary weights and um, it make, make it difficult to directly update the binary weights using the gradients. Mm. So uh, one solution proposed in the binary neural network paper uh, for this, uh, this problem is, is that to, to store, uh, it can store a set of real value weights for accumulating the gradients. So in the fourth pass, the gradients are calculated with respect to the binary weights. Uh, as shown in this formula, the gradients are calculated using the partial L over partial WB. Mm. And then in the backward pass, we clip the gradients by setting the gradients to zero with respect to the weights uh, that are larger than one, as shown here. Uh, and this up, and then we use this gradient to update the real value of the weights. And then in the next iteration, we can obtain the updated binary weights using the sum of those real value of the weights. Mm. Um, so, okay, so the problem of this common solution is that the sum of the real value weights is taken into consideration in the forward path in calculating the binary weights. While, as we can see in figure A, the blue distribution denoting the real value weights and the yellow lines denoting the binarized weights. And there is a big magnitude difference between the real value weights and the sum of the real value weights. Uh, which is uh, the sum of real value which refers to the binary weights. Uh, thus, to alleviate this magnitude mismatch, we follow the practice in SRNet to multiply the L1 norm of each real value weight, weight matrix as a scaling factor to the sum of the weights, as shown in this formula. This, here, is, this is the, the L1 norm. Um, and uh, and the show, uh, and in this way, the magnitude difference between the real value weights and the binary weights is shrinked, as we can see in this figure B. Uh, and moreover, after chaining the BNs for converge, convergence, we found that the L1 scaling factor can be absorbed by the batch norm layer. And thus, at inference time, we can still use the weights of, uh, of value of the minus one and the one to obtain this. Uh, to obtain the pure binary weights through that function. Mm. And uh, with this adjustment in network architecture and the training strategies, we carried out our experiments on the ImageNet dataset, and we changed the network from scratch with 512 batch size and 225, uh, 256 epochs. We used the atom optimizer with initial learning rate being 0 0.001 and the linear the case schedule and the code can be found in this GitHub page. Mm. And we can see from the table that compared to the previous state of the art XR net, the proposed barrel net achieves 5% higher accuracy without increasing computational cost or model size, which is the highest performance as the time this paper is published. Mm. And further, in our journal extension, we extend the shortcuts to the deep networks with bottleneck structures. And it is a very simple, simple architecture adjustment. Uh, so I will not go into too much details here. Uh, you can check our RDC paper if you are interested. Mm. 
And this table compares both at top one and top five accuracies of our BarioNet with the binarization methods in the BarioNet paper on ResNet 50 and ResNet 152. Uh, we can see that the BarioNet outperforms the binary net by a considerable margin. And here are several take home messages. So when you want to train the binary network to, to achieve high accuracy, what you can do is first adding shortcuts to bypass the binary convolutions. Um, and then um, instead of using the derivative of the clip function to approximate the derivative of some function, we can use a second order approximation to, um, to, to approximate the same derivative, which can produce a higher accuracy. And we can also use the scaling factor to match the magnitude between the binary weights and the real value weight. And further, we can absorb this scaling factor with the batch norm layer after training. And uh, uh, I will pr also provide an interpret code at the end of this pre presentation. Uh, so before I move on to the next uh, paper, uh, do, do, do anyone have any questions? Yes, yeah. yes. Um, I have. A lot. I think we ran a bit fast through through the interesting parts here. So if you can go back to the place where you mentioned um, why we need that scaling factor, the problem, and how you solved it. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. um, so actually, so actually, I think even uh, a one before this. Yes. So yeah. uh, actually, this is this one. This is a solution proposed in the. Mm, in the binary net. So mm -hmm. because binary, binary weights are discrete in, in values, they are minus one to ones. So we can not directly use this uh, gradient to yeah. update the binary weights and taking it that because it, um, actually this won't get updated because the gradient is too small. Mm. Uh -huh. So uh, in the, this uh, binarized neural networks paper, they proposed to like use a uh, uh, use a set of real valid weights, and every time we will calculate the gradient with respect to the binary weights, and uh, and use this uh, gradient to update the real valid weights. Mm. Okay. And they have a set of updated real valid weights, and in the forward pass, they can binarize these real valid weights again mm. to uh, obtain the uh, updated the binary weights, mm -hmm. so that say in this process they can update the binary weights. Um, but just here, the binary weights is calculated with the sum of the real value weights, and uh, in this X null net paper. Well, one second before this, so the real valued weights they are kept across the different epochs, and really they are the ones that are updated. Yes. But then when we use the forward pass, we use their binary representation, right? Yes. Mm hmm Okay. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, uh, so uh, in SDARNet and uh, uh, in our paper, we find that uh, the magnitude of the, the binary weights, the magnitude of the real value weights and its sun has a very, uh, very big gap. So the real value weights, they are um, roughly around the minus 0 0.2 to 0 0.2. Its yeah. magnitude is more, but if we directly take the signs, the magnitude will become minus one and one. The magnitude will become one. Uh, so there's a magnitude difference, and this will uh, affect the gradient calculation. So, so because we are um, mainly using the gradient calculated with respect to binary weights and use it to update real value. So this kind of gradient mismatch will will inf will inf uh, will affect the BNS training. So instead of using the sun, we can use the sun times its magnitude. Here is like this, the denominator is the uh, number of weights and the denominator is the, the sum of the sum of the absolute values in, inside this matrix of the real value weights so that we can match the magnitude. Um, this is the scaling factor. Mm. Um, I'm not sure um, if, if we can go a bit back here. So the drawback, only use the sign of the real valued weights in gradient computing. Yeah, that's what we showed the previous slide. And now the magnitude of the binary weights is different from the real weights. 
which makes sense because the binary is either minus one or plus one, while the real weights are whatever number we want. Mm. So what is the x axis here and the y axis on this graph? Oh, sure. So it is a histogram. So, so an x axis is the, the value and the y axis is the number of weights. Yeah, but this is what we would expect if we have binary weights and real valued weights. This is yes. normal. We can, and we That's can't avoid it because binary weights have to be binary and real valued have to be real valued, right? Yes. Uh, so, mm -hmm. so, so, um, so we can scale the binary weights to like it also have two values. So, but it times a scaling factor. It contains only two values, but instead of being minus one and one, it yeah. is some scaling factor, minus, minus scaling factor or plus scaling factor. And where do we use these um, scaled binary weights? Uh, we use it in the training time and in the new first time we can like, absorb this, uh, absorb this uh, scaling factor by retraining the batch norm because the number of scaling factors equals uh -huh. the number of the scaling factor in batch norm. So they are e um, by some mass calculations, you can easily know that they can absorb, they can be canceled out with each other. It can so, matter uh -huh. with this in the binary count or have it it's in the batch norm. So we so we actually have three uh, three weights. We have the binary, we have the scaled binary, and we have the real valued. We use the scaled binary to calculate the batch norm in train time and in inference time. Is that correct? Uh, actually, we use this scaled scaled weights in mm -hmm. the training time, and uh, and also we have a batch norm layer after it. Like ah, so, so it's not really binary layers. It's a scaled weight layer with a batch norm that makes it as if it's binary. Uh, it's, yeah, it's scaled binary count, uh, and uh, and it has a uh, um, and, and it has a batch norm layer after it. Oh, let me see. Let me show. Let me uh, here, like here. I have the code here. So uh -huh. we have sun. Sun means binarizing the activation, Input. and I have yeah. binary count means binary count, and we have a batch norm after it. So yeah. this. Uh, Inside this one bit count, actually, this the, the weight is the scaled, is the scaled binary binary weights to calculate mm -hmm. the, the accurate gradients. Mm -hmm. And this in the so in the training time, uh, we have this kind this kind of scaled binary weights, mm -hmm. and uh, and in the and it when we want to deploy so our model. We will like after we train for converge, we want to deploy that model. We will um, like set. We will just take the set of the real valued weights because we store the real value weights inside it, uh, and uh, we will use the sun and uh, then we fix this, this count layer and we only retrain the batch norm layer, so that we can absorb this scaling factor and so that in the deployment time we only have this. Uh, a minus once and once stored in the binary count. And uh, so the scaling factors are absorbed in the batch normally. But we said that in inference time, we are using the real valued weights and that one bit convolution layer, right? Uh, uh, in inference times, we are using minus once and once. Oh, perfect. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. And the batch norm is pre-calculated during training or it's every time in inference, it's calculated all over again? It's uh, it uh, it's it's pre calculated during training. Mm -hmm. I think we should use the like the dollar moving average and moving uh, moving. Uh, and we take that scaling factor and we put it in the batch norm when we're doing inference, right? Yes, we start. Perfect. Yes, we will uh -huh. return batch norm and the store these scaling factors and use it for inference. Nice. Okay, makes sense now. Thank you. And and if we can come back to that previous slide, I think there is a couple of more things that I wanted to understand. Yeah, this one. Um, so okay, so then we can match the magnitude. Mm -hmm. um, and why is it important again? Why do we need that magnitude? Uh, actually, um, like this, uh, it's a long proof, mathematical proof. Mm -hmm. Like it won't 
it, it actually we found that it won't affect the forward path calculation because we have this kind of scaling factor in batch norm. It mm -hmm. will normalize all these scaling factors. But actually, the mm, when you when you calculate it, the scaling factor in the batch norm will um, make the gradient to be to be like the uh, the uh, uh, re reverse of the reverse of this scaling factor. So if we, for example, we uh, scale up this uh, scale up this uh, weights by two times, actually the gradients will become one over two. Uh, will become the one over uh, this zero point five uh, of the the original weights. So this mm, half, kind of half the magnitude. Yes. The high, the larger we scale, the smaller the gradient magnitude becomes. Yes. And then yeah. we have zero, we have vanishing gradients problem basically here? Mm, uh, yes, roughly, roughly this problem. So, mm. so it will have the gradient mismatch. So, mm. we, uh, so it is important to match the magnitude in the, uh, in the case of the gradients. Uh -huh. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so now I understand. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, so there are some many more details. So you, we can find it in this uh, uh, IGC paper. So I didn't uh, include too much formulas here to make it uh, like a, um, more concise. Mm -hmm. maybe yeah. I, yes, maybe I should include them. No, that's good, that's good. The more graphs, the less text is the best. So it's a good thing. <laughs> okay. Um, thank so you. So anyone else have any questions? Thank, thank you for the question. It makes the, um, the presentation, more, presentation more clear, I think. Uh, okay, so maybe I will go on. Um, like, uh, so um, based on the barrel net, we proposed the React net last year to further enhance the accuracy of the barrel new networks. And this is uh, this work is done in Carnegie Mellon University with Zhu Tiangshen, Professor Marius Sevitis, and supervised by um, my supervisor Quantin Zhen. Uh, and uh, as mentioned in the last paper, uh, the binary network have a huge accuracy gap from its real value counterparts. For example, the BNN paper uh, only achieves 42.2 uh, top one accuracy on the ImageNet classification data set with the ResNet at a structure. And the SRNet achieves 51.2% accuracy. Uh, and our previous BarrelNet paper achieves 56.4% accuracy. And, um, and all these binary networks are based on the ResNet 18 structure. However, the real value of the ResNet 18's accuracy is 69.3%. So there is a huge gap between the state-of-the-art binary networks and the real value networks. Thus, in this work, we are motivated to further enhance the accuracy of the binary networks and bridge the gap. Mm. And uh, an interesting observation we made is that in experiment, a distribution shift has a small influence on the semantic information in the real value feature map, but will largely affect the feature map quality for the binary feature maps. Uh, and this figure shows the real value of the feature map and its binarized version when binarized with a fixed threshold. As we can see here, if the if the distribution changes slightly, uh, we can still recognize the feature map as cat for the real value of feature maps. But uh, it is uh, uh, it comes to when it comes to the binary case, the feature map will be very vague if the di distribution is not suitable or binarized. Uh, it's not suitable for binarization. Mm. Like uh, uh, to overcome this challenge and provide suitable feature maps for BNNs to learn the important semantic information, we propose the add sun to explicitly learn the threshold of binarization in the sun function and the react period to learn the shift and reshape parameters in the nonlinear function. For example, react sun will start from the binarization threshold being zero and learns our optimal threshold alpha by uh, for the binarization for uh, through the back propagation. Uh, and for red period here, we illustrate how the learnable distribution shift and restrict parameters operates in the red period. 
uh, we will first learn to shift parameter gamma to place the distribution at a proper threshold here. And then we apply the reshape to modify the negative, negative part of the distribution. And we then apply a shift parameter eta again uh, to reshape the distribution and make it suitable for binarization. Mm, and we can see that the derivative of the parameters in the real-add sign and real-add period can be easily computed. And uh, the whole network with the real-add operations are end-to-end -end differentiable. Mm. And besides the real-add operations, we further propose a strong baseline network based on the compact neural network by real net, uh, uh, mobile net, uh, mobile net VV, V1. Uh, as we can see in the figure, the original mobile net version one does not contain shortcuts. In experiments, if we directly binarize it, it will encounter a severe accuracy drop, and as we discussed it in the previous work. Mm. And we propose a baseline network design by adding shortcuts to the each to each convolution block. And when it comes to the downsampling layers, we will add average pooling to match the feature match the feature map size and also duplicate the activations to match, match the channel numbers. Uh, in this way, we can again use the parameter free shortcuts in the downsampling layers to propagate the real value feature maps. And we also change, change the depth size count to the Valina count. And this baseline network only consumes 87 million flops and already achieves 61% accuracy. Mm. Then we add React operations to the proposed baseline network. The React operations are denoted in green color, and we co combine the knowledge distillation in chaining the React net. This, this contribution collaboratively produced the React net with top one accuracy of 69% and, and with only 87 million flops. For the first time, uh, this React this uh, binary, binary neural network can uh, achieve the real value of the ResNet level accuracy. Uh, and here we plot the accuracy flops chart for the comparison with other binary networks methods. Uh, the React net series, uh, as denoted in the red, red stars, uh, we can see that the proposed React net achieves a better accuracy computation trade off than other networks. And it even surpassed the, re the re uh, real value of ResNet 18 mm. line. And then uh, we visualize the histograms of activation distributions inside the trend based on network and the React net. Uh, and it is interesting that uh, compared to the baseline network without the Red sign, red period. The distribution inside the red net, as shown in the second row, are, it is more in uh, the distribution are more enriched and subtle. Uh, as here, as as we can see in this fourth subfigure, uh, the red net can ca capture the multi peak di distributions. Also, in red net. Uh, as we can see in the second subfigure, the distribution of binary activations in the uh, in the binary count in Red Net is more balanced, suggesting a better utilization of the black and white pixels, uh, those binary pixels in represent representing representing the uh, binary features. Uh, and, and again, I will provide the codes of Red Net operations at the end. Mm, and uh, any questions? for the Adnet paper. Yes, <laughs> also, if we can go back to the X histogram, I think it was those uh, green graphs. Uh, uh, more back, I think two more slides. Yes. Yeah. Uh, this one, yeah. Uh, this is not a histogram a graph, is it? This is the values of the activation based on something, if I understood correctly. Uh, yes, it, yes, it's a, uh, this is a histogram of the activations. Oh. Like, oh, we have how many, like how many uh, activations are like from in each bin, mm. from, from five to five. Okay, mm. okay. So this is, yeah, this makes no more sense. Um, yeah. So um, is this, this histogram is calculated based on what? Is it just random input or a specific data set input? Oh yeah, it's just a random batch in the ImageNet dataset. A random batch from ImageNet. Mm -hmm. Okay, 
And next slide, I think, no. Um, yeah. Another one? No, then forward. And this was okay. This okay, a, a bit more forward. Um, there was the slide with um, with the where you saw, where you show that you need the duplication, the duplication oh. part of the network. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, uh, what's the problem with a normal block, and and how does the duplication solve it? I I couldn't understand. Yes, it's just, uh, uh, so we have uh, in the network, we have a normal, normal block, which has the same uh, input and output numbers and feature map size. And yeah. we also have the downsampling block, where the feature map size is reduced by two and the channel is doubled by, uh, it's times, times by two roughly. Um, ah, so this is the duplication of the channel that du du duplicate activation there? Yes, so so we can like I draw it in this way, but actually, um, actually we can like have uh, like have two set two of the shortcuts and this, this uh, like duplicate activations only. Here, I yeah. mean I draw this. I mean like this one one by one convolutions. They are uh, like still has the same the same input and output channel numbers and uh, in. We have two set of this block so that we can have the double the channels channel number, and uh, actually it equals to we have a count layer that have a, a one set of input and output number is uh, equals uh, output number equals to two times the input. Okay, okay, so yeah, that's what wasn't I wasn't sure about because there is no real duplicate of activation. There is a duplicate of the channels on the convolution, which yeah. is using that same activation but twice. For each channel set, it's okay. Yes, to draw a different draw, a different way to draw it. Okay, okay. Propose based on network. Okay, I think um, if we can continue one more slide just to make sure that it makes sense here. Yes, yeah, this true. all makes sense. Okay, <laughs> so that's okay. Bye. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank. You. Thanks for the question. Um, uh, so maybe I, I will continue with the next. Mm, that's the paper. Uh, and uh, from here, we can further study what kind of network structure is beneficial for binary networks. And we propose this word, binarizing mobile net, near evolution based searching, and to use NAS to discover the desired architecture automatically. Uh, and specifically, this work proposed a group wise search space to deal with the limited re representational capability in the binary networks. And this work is done in, in CMU with Hai, Dang, Professor Mario Civitis, Professor Kuang Ning Chen, and Dr. Zhi Qiangshen. Mm. And so the so previous work are mainly focused on compressing the ResNet based structures, but ResNet itself contains much redundancy. And nowadays, more compact network design are proposed like MobileNet, which has higher significance in the practical scenario. In this work, we are motivated to further binarize the MobileNet. Mm. And however, it is challenging to directly binarize the mobile net because the mobile net design utilizes the depth wise count, uh, and the depth wise count is lacking in the representational capability when binarized, <clears throat> which will make the network hard, hard, to hard to converge. However, if we simply replace all the depth wise count with the Valina count, it will again introduce too much computational overhead. Then in this work, we want to search for a trade-off between the depth-wise count and the Valina count. This could be the group convolution. And because dif different layers have different uh, sensitivity to compression, uh, we propose to use evolutionary search algorithm to search for the op optimal layer-wise group numbers. Mm. And our framework contains three stages. In the first stage, we pre-chain a weight shared binary network using stochastic group sampling. And then in the second stage, we use evolutionary search to search for the best layer-wise group numbers with accuracy inferred from the binary network pre-chain in the first step. And lastly, we will change best search network from scratch. 
and for the first step, the supernet chaining, we chain the supernet with random group sampling, which means in, in each iteration, we randomly choose different number of groups in each layer. For example, the group number choice could be one group corresponding to the linear count, and group number equals to the channel number corresponding to the depth wise count, and also the, grid, uh, the group numbers of group convolutions in between. Uh, and the probability of choosing the group number in each layer is IID. Um, and specifically, for the weight sharing in the super network, we propose the matrix level weight sharing in which we store the large, largest weight matrix corresponding to the Valina count with group number equals to one. And then we can sample the diagonal entries of this weight matrix to serve as the weights for the corresponding group convolutions. So in this figure, we draw a weight matrix with uh, six input channels and six output channels. And the kernel size is hidden here for, for clarity. We can imagine that each small grid here uh, represents a three by three kernel. And when using the depth-wise convolution, we just assemble the diagonal entries and the, here, as shown here to, to use in, in the network chaining. Um, then for the evolution search stage, we will start with randomizing a set of room number combinations. And then we will uh, evaluate those group number choices based on the weights per chain in the supernet. And further, we can use the crossover and mutation to evolve these group number choices. And we will pick the best group number combination with the highest validation accuracy as our, uh, to be our final search network. And then to evaluate the accuracy of the search network, we chain it from scratch on the chaining set. Uh, so here is the data set split details for our experiments. At training time, we split the original image into sub-validation set, which contains 50,000 images randomly selected from the chain images uh, with 50 images in each 1,000 classes. And the sub-training data set consists of the rest of images. We train the supernet on the sub-training data set and evaluating the performance of parent network on the sub-validation sub set in the search phase. Uh, after obtaining the best parent net, uh, uh, after, uh, after obtaining the best network, uh, and the, uh, this network is trained from scratch on the original training set and evaluated on the image and validation data set. Mm -hmm. And this is the, ex the experimental result here shows that the network obtained with our proposed search algorithm achieves higher accuracy than the previous works, including BioNet, XNORNet, CIBCN, and under similar computational costs. Mm. And uh, that, this is the work for this search, search algorithm. Uh, any questions? Yes. <laughs> The, if we can go to the first slide here, the motivation, uh, the one that says, what was the problem with mobile net, uh, binarization of mobile net, start compact is, uh, yeah, this one, binarized mobile net. Um, so lack of representation capability, of course, because we're taking, um, um, if I understood correctly, we're taking real valued weights and turning them to binarized weights. Mm -hmm. Um, van vanilla convolution, uh, that I, I didn't understand what that means. Oh, yes. So, so because uh, like depth wise count and uh, we are binarizing depth wise count. So uh, here, uh, here we have a size of only three by three by one. So its outputs can only choose a value from like minus nine to nine, only oh. like zero values. So it's very, it's, uh, it's very lack in the, Representation capability. So mm -hmm. the linear count means that we can we can replace depth wise count with the linear count. Like we can still obtain we can still keep the uh, channel numbers to the to the number of to the just just set group equals to one and have the input and output as the uh, uh, input output size in each weight kernel. Mm -hmm. So oh. 
Well, so vanilla convolution says, look, if we have a one channel um, convolution, then we can enlarge this as much as we want, see channels, and each channel is actually the same, is the same as before as a duplicate. Uh, then we can get a representation. That's what it means. Uh, no, and, and, and it's not the, like duplicate. It's just uh, like uh, in, for example, in ResNet, they are using the vanilla count. Like it has 64 input channel and 64 output channel. And each mm -hmm. three by three, uh, each three by three uh, weight matrix, it has 64 channels. Yeah. But, but if in the depth wise case, we have we the visual map size has like the city for input channel, city for output channel, but the depth wise count it only has like three times three, and it has only one channels, but it has like city four of this three by three by one kernel, uh -huh. and each is each of each weight kernel will convolve with one feature map, only a a slice of a channel of feature map, but the vanilla come, it will come with the whole channel of the feature map and to generate one feature map. So that's so, the, yes. So vanilla comp basically means we're using more than one channel uh, for a weight matrix, right? Oh, uh, in order uh, to enlarge representation. Mm, yes, so it basically means we do not use any group count. Uh, like we only have, we have how many input channels and how many output channels. So weight kernel, the output channels of weight kernels uh, equals to the output of the, the feature, maps, feature map channels. Mm. So I'm just looking here on the third line on the right side, that green um, um, square, yeah, it says minus nine times C. And C, I mm -hmm. guess, is the number of channels. Yes. So, so, so the output here is, is just a one channel, but we're using a convolution with C channels, if I understand correctly. So yes, this, this means, uh, just means one, one weight kernel, it will output one, but we have like C of those, uh, C of this, this uh, kernels. So we will output C, C numbers like. So, so that green, um, um, that green uh, square is actually has C um, channels on it. It's actually um, two mm. by two by C um, cube or? Uh, yes, we are only re representing representing one weight kernel. Uh, and uh, and the, in an actual, ne actual network, that like we may have like C channel, we may have C output channels or like two C output channels. So we have, we have like a C of this kind of operations and we will ge generate C, C channels like. So why do why does it, the output show three times C or minus three times C if we have C outputs? It's um, not a concatenation of all, it's not a summation of all of the outputs. Each one is to itself, if I understand right. Oh, uh, yes, yes, they are like actually concatenations of of those feature maps. So it's a summation. We're taking all those feature maps and we sum them um, into one feature map. Uh, like two by for two. The, for the input, for the input channel, it's mm -hmm. a multiplication and a summation. But for the out number of output channels, it's just a concatenating in the in the in the output channel dimension. Like we have, we we can imagine it is just one kernel operation. If, yeah. And if we have, uh, in, in actual network, we don't don't have only one kernel, but we have like a output number of, of output channel number of kernels. Yeah. And we'll use that number of convolution operation and we will output this output number of channel feature maps. And this feature, these feature maps are concatenated to each other to form a like, a, uh, from 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 matrix to tensor, like it will increase to the uh, to the channel dimension. They are concatenated in the channel dimension. So why does it say minus nine times c then, if we're concatenating oh, and we're yeah. not summing? Uh, we are summing summing through the input input dimension. The those input channels we are summing it up. Mm hmm. Mm. 
or where a right. decimation is happening on the input, not on the output? Yes. Uh-huh. Oh, yes. so I don't understand mm. at all. <laughs> if we can, is there a, like a maybe then, is there a way to, uh, well, to define the size of the input, the size of the kernel and the size of the output then? Um. Mm. Yes, so um, like, um, so we can like, we can take it just uh, we forget about the output channel. We just, uh, for example, we only have one output, tra output channel. Okay. We just uh, simplify the situation, um, yeah. but but we we need uh, we keep in mind that it's not the actual case in neural network because in neural yeah. network we have multiplication multiple of these uh, mm -hmm. operations and to form the output channels. So here here we only have one output channel and mm -hmm. C input channels. So for the C input channels we have we have a multiplication and the summation along this uh, simple channels. And this equals to Valina count because, because we are summing all the channel numbers. And because uh, and why is it minus nine times C and nine times C? Because uh, in here for the weight matrix, it has, uh, uh, it in each count, count operation, it has uh, three times three times the C uh, operation mm -hmm. size. And so that in each in each entry, it can choose either minus one or one. Yeah. So when we sum up the biggest the biggest value is minus nine times c, and this, because for 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 all the entries to be minus one after the explore operation, and the largest value could be nine times c, for for the for the external operation outputs all once. So that's the value range. Ah, okay, okay. Now maybe it's a bit more, but um, the value range is if if it, everything is minus one, then the value range could be minimum minus nine times c. If all the weights are plus one, then that maximum value range is nine times c. Yes. Okay, but like in this specific example, we use three c because there are three ones, or I think there is uh, equal amounts of ones and equal amounts of minus ones. If I like quickly look at it. Yeah, yeah, yes. something like that. So, so uh -huh. that something like that. And ah, also, yeah, they are they can choose the value of like the all the values, also all the values between this range. Yeah. Not, not, not the not just the multiplication of the C, not just it's here we type we write three C for just for some simplification. Uh huh. So ba and this means that basically that output is depending on the amount of channels we're using. Okay, this makes sense. And yeah. because we're using a C amount of channels, this adds on to our computational um, complexity because yeah. we need to compute all those um, all those extra summation points. Okay, okay. Now um, your work group convolution, the group is the layer wise search. Now this, I couldn't understand what this means also. It does it mean to search for that C amount each time or? Uh, yes, we have like for convolution layer, we have mm -hmm. like like the parameters of uh, input number of channels and output number of channels and also the group, the number of groups, number of groups. So we are basically search, searching the number of groups. So what is the difference between the number of channels and the number of groups? So we have, for example, we have 64 input groups and the 64 output groups. And uh, yeah. if, if we use the group number equal to one, so we have, so it, uh, it has, it, uh, it can have a difference on the number of weight parameters and number of blobs. So we have 64 inputs, 64 outputs. If the, uh, if the group number equals to one, so which matrix size is uh, Three by three by sixty-four by sixty-four, right? And if we have the group number equals to sixty-four, so which matrix size is three by three by one by sixty-four? So this because each weight kernel is involving with only one feature map, it's depth-wise count. Ah, so so the group the group size means how many basically how many number of kernels we're using? Right, and the uh, channel number it means the input and the output size. Yes, 
the the channel number means in important process and the group number means we divide this is the this the input channel into how many groups and the so we turn only convolve with the, the subgroups. Can, can you repeat that last thing? It, it's, it's a bit cut off the line. Um, yeah, sure. The mm -hmm. group number means the each each which is only convolved with a set of uh, a set of a set of channels. So we are not convolving the whole channels of the input activation. Just uh, we group it, group the activation into like several groups. And uh, each weight is is responsible for convolving with each subgroup, and so that the weights can have less channels. Ah, so if we have sixty four channels but one group, then all the convolution is convolving for the sixty four channels. Yeah. But if we have sixty four channels and two groups, mm. then we have two convolution operations basically, one per thirty two channels. Yes, 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 exactly. Ah, okay, okay. So uh, the group actually means how many convolution processes we do mm. across how many channels. Okay, yes. and then we do layer-wise search. What is that? Uh, layer-wise search means like we search the group numbers for each layer. So we are instead of we choose the same group numbers for each layer, we just layer-wise layer search how many groups we want to use in for each layer. Ah, uh, okay, okay, yeah. So okay, now it makes sense, yeah. And can we continue to the next slide? Okay, so what do we have here? That's the binary network pre-training, and here we have classification score, evolutionary control. Yeah, so I, I got lost also here. So evolutionary search means for each layer, we're calculating the number of groups and evaluate the final search network. Okay, this is after we know the number of groups, but this optimal number should be changing with the epochs, no? Like each training epoch, the number might be different. Yes, so it is for, for supernatural training. For different epochs, so we randomize different layer wise group numbers. Could you explain again? Uh, so with the supernatural training, different epochs, in different epochs, we have different number of group numbers. That because we want, want the supernatural to learn to gener generate weights for different kind of combinations. So, so yeah. yeah. And so, so, uh, so we do a search for each epoch. We do a search process for the number of groups. Uh, it's uh, it's can it's it is uh, um, do step by step. So this supernatural training, we will change uh, till converge like uh -huh. for for like 60, 60 epochs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in each iteration, we we will have different number of groups. Uh, for each layer, so we will we will randomly changing the group numbers to let the supernet learn how to change those weights corresponding to different group choices. Uh huh. And since this supernet is changeable convert in it, the weights are fixed. We do not update the weights, and mm -hmm. we use those weights in the evolutionary search stage. And in the evolutionary stage, we have like a population. This kind of population are 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 genes of the genes of the network. So such genes, each gene is corresponding to a combination of of group numbers in each layer. So we mm -hmm. need to evaluate whether this gene is good or not. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And using we how we evaluate is we evaluate using the weight trend in this supernet. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, this makes a bit more sense. Now, another question here, while we're training the supernet, if we're using random groups, how can we save all those weights? Because for example, let's take that example we talked about, 64 input channel, 64 output channel, and the amount of groups here changes from one to 32, basically. And each, each group number is a different set of weights, right? Well, yes, actually we are using it's a very good question. So we are, we are basically using our weight sharing mechanism. So here, uh -huh. like this is the so the biggest weight mechanism corresponding to the to the Valina count. 
like uh, for the input channel, it's for e each input channel, we use all those weights to convert with all the input channels. And if we come to depth wise, or, or we come to the group number equals to three, we each uh, weight uh, will only, only convert with two input channels. And, uh, and uh, we just use the diagonal matrix. And when it comes to depth wise, uh, each, uh, each weight matrix only convert with one input channel. And we only need to use this four, uh, six, six, uh, six entries. Wait, wait, uh, again, if you can explain. Um, so the number of input channels, the number of output channels, that's okay. And now each box, uh, each, each square represents the intersection of how many input channels and output channels and how many groups we have in this case. So on this right thing, on the diagonal, this is just groups with size one, right? Mm, uh, this is the, the biggest matrix equals to group size equals to one. The diagonal, mm -hmm. this is six diagonal equals to the depth wise case. Mm -hmm. We can we use this, uh, this one grid as the three by three kernel, a three by three kernel. Uh -huh. And on the left side, this is group size equals to two. So we have one and two in this case. Mm, left. Uh, this yes, one, this, yeah. This, this one corresponding to like, like we have the biggest one is group equal to two. And this is the, this is the one, this small, small square is group equal to three. And this is the diagonal matrix is a group equal to six. Oh, I don't understand. No. How many? Uh, oh, yeah. I'm sorry for all the questions, but um, it's fine. you know, I think if I'm asking them, probably other people will be asking. So it's good that we're covering it. Yeah. This so, is the big, big. Yes. What is the x axis? Uh, how, how many number of input and output channels do we see on those two big squares? Um, is it 10 input channels? Is it uh, okay. Like, no, I, I'm illustrating the number of channels to be six. Like uh, for this matrix, we have like six input channels and six output channels. Okay, so that's a six by six. Okay, yeah. And now um, if we can again discuss the right side, what do we see on the right side? Yes. Uh, so right side, it has the like uh, the group number equal to six. Uh, so, so so each which is uh, convolving with only one channel, like uh, it's the first. Yeah. So the so which matrix convolve with uh, the first channel and generate the first output channel, and the second which matrix convolve with the second input channel generate the second output. Channel. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, and on the left side, what do we see? Yeah. So uh, for for the first which matrix, we have we convolve with the the first two input channels. Like I mean, the in the group equal to three case, the first uh, the first uh, with matrix is it has two input channels. Like it convolves with two input channels and generates the first output channel. And the second matrix again convolves with the first two input channels and generates uh, the second output channel. And then the third weight matrix convolves with uh, the the this uh, yeah, 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 yeah. the middle two input channels. And generates the third output channel, and this uh, this convolution come up with uh, again this middle two input channels. Yeah, so so we actually on so on the right side we actually have six groups, right? Yes. And uh, on the left side we have three groups. Each yes, group, yes. Each group of size two. Yes. Of two channels. Yes. Exactly. Ooh. Okay, okay. And each group is, is separate weights, right? Let's say on the right side, there's six groups with separate weights between each the, uh, each of the group, yeah? Yes, each group says so this weights are individually learned. They are not shared. Okay, 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 okay. And we're showing that, uh, why do we have this representation of the lines and the dots? Why is it interesting to show that separation? It's because they are actually, when we chain a group with uh, three, we are like reusing the weights used in the group includes to six case. So say this this two matrices, these two big matrices they are shared. They are not ah. separate big matrices. 
Uh -huh. The weights are shared on those specific, uh, specific uh, painted uh, squares. So we, if we train that six group, um, uh, that right side six groups, then we can use those trained groups on the left side and we just need to add six more um, training uh, groups. Aha, uh -huh. okay. So now if we go back to the original question, which was the super net, I think the super net training, then we have the random groups, but actually those random groups, um, some of them are shared. Yes. And so, every, every time we randomly select which group we're training. Mm, right? Yes. Yes. Exactly. Okay. Whoa. Okay. Yeah. So, but actually, this is not entirely random because the group, um, the group of size one, will always be trained because it's every time this on the diagonal, it's all the time existing. Yes. So group group would never equals to the channel numbers. The depth wise case, this is is always trained. And it's, yeah. it's used the most because it's, it is used the most. So it, it is good that it is well changed. Uh, why, I get, why is it used the most? Why, like what's the intuition there? As, aside from, of course, it's used the most because it's always trained. Like, but why do we want it to be used the most? Mm, because, because if we change, if we separate different groups differently, it will be hard to like change, change those those weights, uh -huh. like because we have too many weights in memory. So we yeah. if we can share it because we have limited iterations. So so we share those weights, and that's because each weight actually um this weight is always convolving with the first input channel and the generate in the first yeah. output channel. It's yeah. its function is not changing during different whatever whatever group numbers it is in. So, so because its function is not changing, so we can use the same set of weights for different groups. Mm -hmm. So we, it is okay to share those weights. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, yeah, so that makes sense. <laughs> okay, okay. If we can go back now to the, the previous, I think, um, yeah, this one. Each iteration randomly choose different number of groups. Number of groups choices one, two, four, yeah. Um, up to the number of the channels. Probability of choosing the group number in each layer is independent. Uh -huh. By the way, I would argue here that you want to have a higher, like you want the weight to be not really, like the probability should, I don't know if it's, by the way, is it a uniform probability or is there a specific type of probability we're using here? Yes, it's a uniform probability. So I would argue that we would want to have a probability that um, prefers or puts a higher weight on picking those situations when there are multiple numbers of groups, like we saw like the left side instead of the right side, right? Because we want to have more information being trained for the groups. And then after that, you know what I mean? I know that's like some folk, uh, some folk or some like some attentive loss. Yeah, yeah. Like let's Actually, say like it's not attentive loss, but yeah, the same idea that you want to put the attention on the harder parts. Yes, it's a very interesting point, and some paper like attentive loss they explore this this uh, this aspect like using the uh, the the parietal curve, the hardest parietal curve and the best parietal curve. And these two lines to like guide guide this kind of uh, to emphasize the loss in this hardest uh, hardest choice and this easiest choice and this and this kind of loss can improve this uh, improves uh, training and mm -hmm. this might be another direction to optimize the supernet. Mm. Right. Okay, okay, and if we can then continue to the next slide. Evolutionary search is after the training is done. We're trying to figure out what's the best combo. That makes sense. And the next slide, randomized set group number combination. You have other group number choice based on weight pre train Yeah, using crossover and mutation to evolve the group. Okay, pick the best group number combination with highest validation. Yeah, okay, nice, nice. Yeah, yeah and think next slide. 
final mm. search network from scratch on the original training data set valid on the original. So here, now once we know the number of groups, we do another training run using that specific set number of groups. Yeah. Perfect, okay, understood. And now we have image net set training, sub-validation set, super net training, evolution search. And after we do the evolution search, we need to do another training run. And this is that right side or? Evolution search, we don't need to change the net. Oh, that's, I, I, I like chance, I need to change order. I mistake this. My super net training is here and like step two is here. That we after, need to after we have already, after we have the firstly trained uh, different groups, we do evolution search and another super net training. Yeah. Yes, yes. We, we do the evolution search on the validation set. We do the super net training on the, on the train. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, okay. Yeah, I think that was, yeah, that was it. Wow, <laughs> good. So, so there's like two more works here. Uh, like, uh, so um, I will go quick through these works. Uh, like them for better, uh, thank a lot for the questions. And okay, so for her, like better explain and understand the inner mechanism of appearance. Uh, like I will present this understand paper and this is, a collaboration paper with the Plum AI company with Cohen, James, Lucas, and the RealNet. Mm. And the, so conventionally, as we introduced before, the binary weight update involves a set of latent real valid weights to accumulate the gradients. And what we did, uh, and uh, this is also what we did in the BarioNet and ReactNet. And then the binary weights are obtained through taking the set of real valid, valid weights and the uh, and uh, to calculate the loss and the gradients for updating those real value weights. Uh, so, the, so we can see that those real value weights are actually not directly used in the for the past to compute the loss of gradients, but instead the binary weights are used in the for the past. So those real value weights can be regarded as the latent weights. Mm. So, so the characteristic of having a set of latent weights makes the BNS harder to interpret compared to the real value weights in the real value networks, as we can see in the red figure, which the weights are directly used in the forward computation and level calculation. But in the left, left figure, the real value weights in the conventional BNS are not participating the, the forward loss computation. So we argue that these latent weights cannot be treated analogously to the weights in the real value weights. And this, uh, this latent weights need special um, investigation. And, in, uh, and we argue that the main role of this real value latent weights are actually to accumulate the gradients and to uh, provide inertia during training. And th this inertia means that when the absolute value of real value latent weights are high, more constant gradients towards the opposite direction needs to be accumulated before the real value weights to change the sign. And if the real value weights are close to zero, the corresponding binary weights are easy to change their sign, given a small gradient updates. As we visualize the distribution of the real value weights inside and optimize the BNN, the distribution emerged to three peaks. One is the middle peak with the value around zero, and other two peaks has a value of minus one one. Meaning that I will optimize the a well optimized BNN network. Most uh, real value latent weights are large in magnitude, and the inertia of the network is high. So, uh, for from this perspective, we further think whether we can achieve the function of inertia without using the real value latent weights. And we find that the momentum term in the optimizer can also naturally serve as the inertia because it is accumulating the historical gradients. And if the momentum is large, the momentum will un be unlikely to change the sun given small gradients in the optis opti optic uh, opposite direction. Uh, based on this hypothesis, we propose a BOP, a binary optimizer, in which we accumulate the, the small gradients by the moving average in the momentum term and by compare, comparing the exponential moving energy MT with a threshold tau, we can determine whether to flip each weights or not. Mm. And uh, in this way, we can update the binary weights without relying on the real value of the latent weights. 
and this can make the BNS more interpretable. Uh, here we show that we can achieve similar or higher uh, accuracy than the previous BNS optimization methods that use the latent weights. Uh, and, uh, and this is basically for the latent weights part. Hmm. Any questions or should I finish this uh, S2BN and have questions together? Mm. Mm. Oh, okay, so I will continue with this paper. So after that, we investigate into a more challenging scenario that is self-supervised BNN. We propose S squared BNN to bridge the gap between self-supervised binary network and the self-supervised real value network via the guided distributional calibration. This work is done in CMU with Zhi uh, and also collaborate with uh, IAI with Jie Ting Wei Huang and uh, and also my supervisor in HKUSC, Tim Quanting Chen, um, and also Professor Marius Vidis. Mm, and the, the scenario is challenging because the label is not available and the weights and activations are binarized. So, so investigation under this scenario can also provide some intuitions for using or chaining campaign networks under the self supervised scenario. So this, this problem is not explored before. Mm. And so first of all, a natural question we want to ask is, is the well-performing well constructive learning scheme in real value network still suitable for self beings mm. To answer this question, we first follow the previous practice in training the self-supervised real value network. So we start with the contrasted loss in training the binary networks, but we soon find that the representational capability of BNS is relatively limited, relatively limited. So the output prediction is less confident than that of the real value network. Hence, we argue that the conventional self-supervising learning method uh, using the constructive loss for real value network may not be optimal to change the self-supervised BNS. Hmm. So using the, using the contrastive loss for BNS may not be the optimal solution. So based on this observation, we propose to use the KL divergence loss between the real value of the network and the binary network, as well as the contrastive loss to get self-supervised learning of BNS. This additional branch of real value, real value guidance brings around the 3% accuracy enhancement. And but further, when we visualize the feature maps, in the binary network learned from the contrastive loss and the real value network learned from contrastive loss, we can find that the feature map learned from self supervised beings are made much, big, much bigger compared to the real value networks. Thus, we anticipate that the branch of contrastive loss may even harm the, the BN from learning informative features. Uh, based on that, based on this. Uh, observation, we propose to remove the branch of contrastive learning and only use the KL divergence between the real value net and the binary network. In this way, we can only we can use only the KL divergence loss branch and use the pre-trained real value network as teacher network to distill the binary network. And this proposed method further enhances the performance by 5%. So specifically, the real net so real value teacher network is learned from the contrastive loss with self-supervised learning. Hmm. And uh, oh, this is another illustration. And here's uh, the, is the experimental result. So each proposed method brings like three to 5% accuracy boost. And overall we achieve like 14% at higher accuracy than the baseline. And so this is basically the so S2BN paper. Mm, and uh, I will go into the code if uh, if you have, uh, and first I want to know if any, any question for these two papers. I don't think I have any specific question. I will have a general question. Um, a comparison between all of, of these methods you showed us, is there, or is it even possible? Is it comparing apples to apples or? I couldn't see if the com if there could be an apples to apples comparison here or not between all the four papers we've covered today. Uh, uh, compare compares these different uh, different papers. You mean? Yeah, like like you're showing here your results, sixty one point five accuracy. Uh, this uh, 
Actually, the last paper, the last two papers, they are running under different settings. Like this S2BN is running under the self supervised scenario. So it's different uh, settings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it can't be compared. Work. Yeah. Yes, service works are supervised scenario. And this one, this one is like using a, a new optimizer. It achieves around, it can be compared with Spirunet because it's published on 2019 before. This is before the ReactNet and the Binary Symbol Binary both. So it's, it's running on the uh, ResNet and it achieves a comparable accuracy as Spirunet, but it's using a novel, novel and more straightforward optimizer for BNS. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And uh, so for the, those three previous three works, they can compare the apple to apple. Like uh, uh, the, the binary symbol binet, it's actually it's, it's proposed before the React net. Uh, uh, binary, it's, it's CVPR 2020. Uh, here, this is CVPR 2020. Um, like uh, it is, uh, uh, this binary symbol binet, it, it, is, uh, it can achieve the higher accuracy than binary net and, uh, and uh, and then our reactionet it is a currently state of the art. I think it is to our best of knowledge, this is a current SOTA, SOTA binary networks mm -hmm. that the highest accuracy. And cool. we both both the mobile based version and the ResNet based version. Hmm. And this mm -hmm. is a, a SOTA accuracy. Hmm. Nice. Hmm. Okay. We are actually we are running out of time, I think. Maybe, uh, do I, I, I can briefly go into the, uh, the codes and- uh, I like, think we are actually two minutes left. <laughs> okay. Like, we are right on time. So maybe it's time for questions. Anybody else? Yeah. I Let me say, check the, I was checking before, but let me check again the chat. Nobody asked nothing on Zoom and on YouTube Live. Also no questions. Comments, anybody here? We have about a couple of minutes left. No. So I think, uh, Zichen, we could, um, I think we could conclude if, if, if you have something to conclude with, otherwise I could uh, briefly conclude. Yeah, you can, you can conclude. Yeah. So really, uh, um, really interesting talk, very mathematical. Um, thank you for that. Um, very productive also in two years, uh, five advances in different directions. Um, so really nice job. Um, I would say uh, thank you Zechen for, for coming here and giving this talk to us. Um, thank you, Peter. Pedro Silva is also, is also saying uh, similar words and a couple of more others we have now on the chat here. Uh, thank you everybody for joining and tuning in. Um, you have all the places where we can find the community for other events. And you know what? I will send it here again so it'll be easier for all. This talk will be recorded, is already live on YouTube, will also be um, static and not live on YouTube, I think, in one to two days. And with this, I will say bye to all. Okay, thank you. Bye. And have a good day. Thank you.